You're now listening to the Live Different Podcast with Matt Wilson. What's up, guys? It's Matt. I just got off Skype with awesome guy, someone who I consider a friend and mentor, Michael Roberto. He has a lot of value in this podcast coming up, and we did not have the best connection, so I want to apologize if this is the first time that you've listened into the Live Different podcast. This is not usually how it is, but we have linked up a ton of great stuff for you in the show notes on under30ceo.com. And uh, I'm just so grateful for for Mike's time. And uh, I know that there's so much value here for all of you. Maybe you want to listen to it on 1.5x speed. I think that is a great hack. And I know it sounds quick at first, but your brain really does catch up uh, within a few minutes. So I, that would be a hack that I would share with you all. And uh, I hope that you get some some value out of this. His book is on unlocking creativity and I can definitely say that anything that Mike puts out is is going to be really, really solid. So listen in. Uh, again, apologies about the connection, but we're doing our best over here. Thanks, guys. Enjoy. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm your host, Matt Wilson, and today I'm here with a friend of mine, Michael Roberto. He is trustee professor of management at Bryant University, my alma mater, and the author of the new book, Unlocking Creativity, How to Solve Any Problem and Make the Best Decisions by Shifting Creative Mindsets. He is the creator of three audio video lecture series with the great courses. Actually, Mike, I want to introduce you. I started to read the bio, but it's more understated than I heard, and I want to share a little bit of our story, if you will. But first, I just want to to say welcome and thanks for coming on. It's great to talk to you, Matt. And I, I bet I know where you're going to start, which is you walking into my office, uh, I think, 13 years ago now. Wow, 13 years ago. Okay, that would have been, well, I was a freshman in 2004 at Bryant. Was that your first year or maybe 2005 was your first year at Bryant? My first year was 06. 06. Okay. I think you were a junior when you walked in. Okay, yeah, junior. For some reason, I remember it as sophomore or maybe it was junior. I don't know. You remember walking into my office though, don't you? Yeah, I absolutely remember. And I want to tell everybody how I heard of you and what I heard. And you can fact check because this is well stuck with me for the last 13 years. Are you ready? Sure. Okay, so I heard that we had a new professor on campus and that he was a pretty smart guy and that I should probably go and talk to him if I get the chance. Now, you were only at that time teaching 400 level business courses. And that's why I kind of remember that maybe I was a sophomore because I was definitely not eligible to to sign up for those classes. But I heard, all right, you got to talk to this guy, Mike Roberto. He's a trustee professor. So if we are able to, to get him on board with the Collegiate Entrepreneurs Organization, We'll have a direct, this is what I heard, a direct line to President Makeley. And then I heard Mike was <laughs> Harvard undergrad, Harvard MBA, Harvard PhD, and then became the professor, a teacher of the year at Harvard. And then they told him, all right, we don't give out tenure here on Harvard. You have to go somewhere else and make your impact on that institution and that's how I ended up. I was like, okay, I'll, I'm sold. Let me go talk to this guy. Seek him out wherever it is. Can you confirm or deny any of these allegations, Mike? Oh, I love it. The way I remember it is this really skinny little kid walks in my office. You know, you didn't look like you do today. Your hair was short. <laughs> you were like dressed up nicely. And, and you walked in and you introduced yourself and you said you were the founder of this new chapter of the Collegiate Entrepreneurs Organization. And you needed an advisor and you thought I'd be great. And I had been on campus like two weeks. I didn't even know where the bathrooms were yet. And I was like, who is this kid? Like, I mean, it was it was a hard sell, if I remember it right. Excellent. Well, uh, yeah, thank you. Of course, thank you for that. And it's been been great to stay in touch and follow you over the years. You've written a couple books now. Uh, one of the others uh, that this was 2009, I believe. And I think there's a, a second edition out why great leaders don't take yes for an answer. Oh, I'm sorry. And there's an, maybe another one. And know what you don't know. Is that correct? Those are your two other books. That's right. That's right. 
the first edition of Why Great Leaders came out in 05, just before I got to Bryant. And then I wrote Know What You Don't Know in 09. And I updated Why Great Leaders in 2013. And now this new book here, uh, just to start the new year here in 2019. But as you know, a lot of this, I've taught different courses at Bryant and gotten to interact with different people. But this is a great book because it really goes all to our conversation, really, first as a student, then when you left. And I got interested in thinking, innovation, and this book really started many years ago in a way. And now it's nice to see it finally culminate. But I, you know, it's part inspired by students who were really interested in going out and doing bold new things, you know, not just doing the ordinary. That was, to me, it's is inspiring. Sure. And, and I want to ask you, of course, about the new book and lessons learned from there and also how you've seen higher education change along the way. Actually, that would be an interesting place to start. I want to ask your opinion because so our, our listeners, of, of course, are uh, ages 21 to 35 for the most part. And a lot of people have this stigma these days against higher education because it's so expensive. And a lot of times it just doesn't guarantee that you're going to get a job at all or the job that you want. And there's, you know, people in higher education are taking a lot of flack these days. And so I'm curious how you've seen institutions like Bryant, but also just higher education in general, innovate. Oh, I think, Matt, we deserve a lot of the criticism, right? I mean, I, let's be honest, and I, I mean that more generally across higher ed, right? I mean, because we charge a great deal of money, and at a lot of institutions, we haven't innovated on the teaching side. You know, there's a great presentation I saw by Julie Shell of the University of Texas. She came to Bryant, and she started her presentation by saying, um, I want you to imagine you're in the year 1800, and you're going in for surgery. What do you think the operating room looks like? Close your eyes. We all, and then she said, open your eyes. And she showed us a picture of, a, of an operating room in the 1800s. Freaks you out, right? It's really scary. Like they brace you to the table, you know. Uh, and then she showed us an operating room today, right? And it's modern technology, robotics, everything. And then she says, okay, so now let me show you a classroom 2000 years ago and a classroom today. And they're basically the exact same thing, right? I mean, we haven't changed. Like we've been stuck. That's one problem. And I think the other problem is, for a long time, I think there were too many ivory towers that weren't thinking about how are we going to prepare you for a career, right? We were saying it's learning for learning's sake. We're developing young minds, all this wonderful idealistic stuff, which I do believe in. But at the end of the day, if you're paying a quarter of a million dollars to go to school, you better prepare people for you know a job, a career, et cetera. And I, I think at Bryant, we really have worked on that hard over the years, you know, about launching a career. Yes, we want you to learn critical thinking and be broad-minded and well-rounded. But at the end of the day, you know, you're, pay, you're a customer, not just a student, right? And we have sure. to deliver a return. So we're getting better. But I, I think higher ed deserves some of the criticism because we've, we've been slow to change. Yeah, I, I mean, I've heard this recently. Maybe it stems from this uh, specific talk. If I don't remember the name of who you just said from University of Texas has been going around giving this talk. But I've heard of this concept where higher education is relatively the same as it was 100, 150 years ago, 1863, when Bryant was founded. I mean, it's mainly lectures. Of course, there are projects and uh, group work, and we're supposed to be simulating more how it would be in the real world environment, which I benefited from quite a bit at Bryant. Uh, but I would, I would say, of course, that I benefited more from the opportunities outside of the classroom than I did from the ones inside. And not to say I didn't have great professors, not to say that uh, I didn't learn a lot inside the classroom, but it's it's kind of like, a, well, you're, you're a Boston guy, the, the old Matt Damon line from Goodwill Hunting when, you know, he says he could have got the same, I'm going to butcher it, of course, but he could have got the the same education for 43 cents and late fees down at the fucking public library, you know? <laughs> so, well, I think, yeah, Brian, we've changed a lot since even when you were here, you know, in terms of we changed our classrooms. They look totally different. There's a lot more action going on in the classroom. We've got a whole new building where there are no podiums. Professors not sitting in front of the room. They're in the middle of the room. Students are working at tables. There's a, a lot of technology. There's a lot of interaction, collaboration, it's a collaborative workspace, not a delivery of material. So we've really tried to change that old model. 
But it's still true that a lot of the great learning happens outside the classroom with our interactions with industry and alumni. And that's important to do. And I think we've really pushed hard on that to try to change, right? But I think the other thing to keep in mind, I hope I instilled in you, I think I did, was it doesn't end when you get the degree. You've got to keep learning. And what we're also trying to do is prepare you to be an independent learner over the course of your lifetime because the skills you learn in today, 10 years from now, you're going to have to have a whole new set of skills, right? No matter what you do, whether it's running your company or, or going to a corporate job or, or launching a new company, it's just the world's too dynamic to think that in four years you got it all and now you're done. Of course not, right? Okay, Mike. So the, the next question that I have for you is if someone is out there who's 16, 17, 18 years old looking to go to undergrad or they are 22, 23, 24, 25, or however old, would you recommend to them straight away, yes, you have to go to college. Yes, you should definitely pursue that degree. I'm curious how your thinking on this has it changed over the years, if any. So I still would recommend going to college. Now, I'm not saying college is for everyone, right? I mean, I think that there are certainly people who you know, are going to become, are going to learn a trade perhaps or do some other things. They might go to a trade school or, or go to some other uh, institute to learn about how to become a, a welder or some other technical job. But, but if your intent is, even if it's your intent to be an entrepreneur, not to go into a corporate job, I still think there's great value in that university education. I, I laugh when I see people like Peter Thiel out in Silicon Valley rail against it and talk about not going to college when, you know, all the people at his venture capital fund all went to Ivy League schools. I mean, come on now, you know, we're being hypocritical, right? I mean, at the end of the day, because there's a lot more value than just the content. You mature at college, you develop a network, you meet people, you develop a set of life skills. I mean, you can get the content free on the web, right? It's not about the content. It's about everything else that happens during that four years that I think is really important. You get mentors, a variety of things. So I, I still think, and of course, the data show the return on investment, even with a high price tag, for most people is still there. Now, I understand that we have to tackle student debt. We have to cost contain. I, I'm not saying everything is perfect, but I still think for most, I would say, you know, if your intent is to be an entrepreneur or to build a company, you would do yourself a disservice if you didn't do it. Now, everyone points to the exception. Steve Jobs dropped out of school. Bill Gates dropped out. Mark Zuckerberg dropped out. But they tend to be the exception, not the rule, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it seems that it would be so much more difficult to build that structure as an 18-year-old for yourself. And uh, when you're in this environment where everybody's in the same boat, everybody can mature there is a lot of value in that. And you could go as an 18-year-old and work for your dream company or start your own company or uh, go and travel. But you're also not around people who are the same age and, and maturity. That I'm sure there's other programs that you could uh, do. One that comes to my mind is Knowles, the uh, outdoor leadership school. So that could, of course, be an optional uh, thing or, or something to do over the summers. Or there's a lot of great ways to become better rounded, I would say. But yeah, it's interesting. And then, Mike, what would you say about uh, postgraduate degrees? Now, that's a little different. I, I think there on the postgraduate side, I would say you really have to think about each situation individually. I think the old days of saying, well, you automatically should go get whatever advanced degree in your field. I think it really ma it depends on your field, right? In some fields, it's a must because of credentials that are required. Obviously, you can't be a doctor without a postgraduate degree. But I think in, in the business side, I think it depends on what you're trying to achieve. You really have to look at individ individual circumstance. So I, I don't think there's a cookie cutter approach anymore uh, for people. It's not automatically to go get the MBA. There, first of all, there are now a variety of, of different kinds of degrees, postgraduate degrees, but also all kinds of certifications, all sorts of other things you might do based on what your interests are and what you're trying to build expertise in. So I don't think it's simple anymore. It's, it's much more complicated. You really have to understand what your personal goals are, what your personal strengths and weaknesses are, and then tailor your strategy to that. Okay. And, and to try to tailor our conversation a little bit more to the listener, so many people are internationally minded who are listening to this. And one thing that emerged at Bryant just when I got there, but 
I didn't pay much attention to it or I just, I don't know, I never got into the program for whatever reason was international business. So Bryant is is now becoming known across the country for their international business program that they've built over the last 10 or 15 years. But, you know, at the time, I didn't really speak Spanish. I mean, I, I took some classes in middle school and dropped it halfway through high school and thought, oh, geez, I don't have the foreign language requirement to get into the program. And I really regret that because still, when I have to write an email in, in Spanish, I'm like, all right, this is taking me way too much time. And my grammar, somebody better proofread this because I basically learned Spanish traveling <laughs> and on in the streets. And uh, yeah, I could say some pretty strange things in, in very colloquial <laughs> ways. Uh, and Mike, I know that you speak Italian, you have family uh, who come from Italy. And of course, we're talking about Bryant, where international business is very big. Uh, we saw each other in, in France a few years ago, where you were there teaching for the summer. You take your kids all over the place. They speak French, as I, as I remember. So I'm curious how people can prepare themselves with or without formal education for becoming more internationally minded in business? I think travel is something, obviously it's a bit of a luxury, right? I understand that it, it's, it can be costly, but I think it is an incredibly invaluable thing. It stretches your mind in new ways. Um, learning other languages, obviously easier to do when you're young, which is why uh, you know I was fortunate because my parents were Italian immigrants, my brother too. So I learned Italian and English simultaneously as a kid. My kids have learned French from a young age. Uh, it's certainly easier then. But then being able to travel and, and learn not just about the language, but the culture, it stretches your mind. There's a great line from uh, Dave Kelly, the founder of IDEO. He says, you know, that when you travel, what happens is that you notice things that you take for granted every day, right? In other words, when you're walking down the street in your hometown or where you live, you know, you go to the coffee shop in the morning, you stop for gas, you go to work, you're really not noticing things. You're on autopilot. But when you're in a new place, you notice everything. You notice all the little differences. How do people from a different country or culture, what's their morning routine? You know, uh, are they coffee drinkers or tea drinkers or what do they do? And that noticing sparks all kinds of ideas, right? But it also stretches your mind just to see a different perspective. So, you know, I think one of the things we really pride ourselves on now is more than half of our students go abroad in some way as part of their undergraduate experience, whether it's for a couple of weeks or for months on, on end. Uh, we go with faculty in many cases. This year, I'm going to Barcelona with a group of students for a month. I've been to Aix-en-Provence where I saw you. So I think it's incredibly valuable. And I think we know that there's huge benefits to it cognitively and it can spark our creativity. So, you know, hugely valuable. Of course. And you mentioned coffee, and the first thing that comes to my mind is, I, I believe, the founders of Starbucks were inspired by a trip to Italy and that kind of community feel of everyone sitting there drinking their little tiny coffees and uh, discussing politics or reading the news or catching up with friends and creating that environment where people come together. I mean, and there's so many more examples, especially when we use something like like coffee. But I'm, I'm curious, Mike, how you think people kind of going into creativity now? Of course, travel for me has been something that has sparked so much creativity. But I'm curious how we can bring that into the classroom. Because sometimes you show up to school and the people around you look and sound much like you and their ideas are relatively the same. And maybe you just don't feel quite as inspired as you do, say, if you're sitting in a little coffee shop in Italy where you're all of a sudden you're thinking a little bit differently. So I'm curious how we can bring that to the classroom if you have any ideas I think there's a couple of really cool things. Right? Technology enables us to do things that we couldn't do before. So as an example, there are these amazing like virtual reality or augmented reality field trips you can take students on. You could take them inside a factory in Thailand via their computer now, right? And you can use Skype or other technologies who put the students through a uh, simulation where they actually don't work on teams with their fellow Brian students. They actually are put on teams with students in other schools around the globe. And these global teams compete with one another, 
all working virtually in this business simulation over the course of a semester. It's just unbelievable experience through technology that, you know, it's obviously not the same as sitting at a cafe in Barcelona or walking down the street in Tokyo, but it does give them an, an exposure, right? And so I think we try to do that. The other thing is, of course, getting students off campus out into the community. A lot of times the communities are, are even more diverse than, of course, the campus itself. And so finding ways to get students engaged with their community is the other way. I think that we try to broaden people's thinking as much as we can. Yeah, I think that last point is so important. I know as a student, I liked to go to downtown Providence and understand how some of the other schools who are not on you know their own little campus are integrated within the cities or Thayer Street, for example, is somewhere where seems to be, I haven't been there in years, but it seemed uh, at the time to be a hub of creativity. You can find different ethnic foods. You can, you know, just more artists and people who would not necessarily find on the campus at Bryant. And now Providence, I, I guess, as you can find in most downtown cities as they're becoming revitalized, you can find more creative workshops and co-working spaces and and stuff like that. So I'm curious how you've seen a place where is fairly conservative, like the state of Rhode Island, how you've seen their creativity change in general. Well, I think we're fortunate because we have uh, a great community of designers, uh, you know, with uh, with the Rhode Island School of Design. We have, uh, you know, obviously a a lot of uh, science and, and going on in healthcare uh, with some great hospitals. We do have a nice mix and a nice blend, but it means you got to go out there and meet people and, and get to events and other things. And we try to promote that as much as we can to students to get out there in the community. We also, all of our students do service learning projects and they engage with a nonprofit somewhere in the community and work on a semester long project as a sophomore. And that's a requirement for all of our students. We're also, I, I've taken more and more students on various uh, trips, even within the U.S., to see different perspectives. So uh, the last couple of years, we've taken uh, a group of honors students out to Silicon Valley and, and to San Francisco for four or five days and immersed themselves in a variety of both startups and larger companies like LinkedIn and Google out there. They've gone out to wine country. They've gone to a variety of startups. They've met with alumni. These kinds of experiences as an undergrad are just invaluable, right? Because um, you don't have to leave the country necessarily to gain a a much broader perspective and spark new ideas. Sure. And also we mentioned that travel is a luxury and of course it comes at a premium, but in comparison with the cost of higher education or say you're already going to school and yeah, things are going to be tight. But if you add in, uh, say there was extra costs for study abroad, the amount that that would increase your overall cost of education would probably be quite nominal in the bigger picture when, when you think of things. So I just wanted to to add that in and then ask you, Mike, I know that you just went on sabbatical. You were able to take a year and focus on your book. You were able to travel a little bit. So I'm, yeah, I'm curious, where, where have you been? What have you been doing? It's been a little while since we last caught up. You know, I, I did take a sabbatical, my first ever. Uh, this is now, I've been teaching for 19 years. And so I decided that primarily the book was going to be my effort. But I had some other things I wanted to do. I had launched this uh, program at Bryant called Bryant Idea, which is all about teaching every single student who comes here about design thinking and creative problem solving. That had been a ton of work. I'd done that for five years. It was time for a break and a sabbatical. And, and the book became the primary project. I wrote the book almost entirely in cafes not in my home office. I wanted a little bit of buzz and a little bit of human interaction. If it got too loud, I'd throw the headphones on, but I, I wanted to be out and about. So I literally would leave the house in the morning and, and go find a cafe and work for you know the whole day. But I did mix that in with travel. Obviously, part of that travel was research, interviewing people you know, in various places, also teaching uh, around the globe, working with executives. So Tokyo, Europe, the various places in the US. Uh, I've gone to Tokyo now, 15 years in a row in the summer to teach uh, an executive program. It's been a great experience. And ultimately culminated in the book, which was a great project to work on, to try to bring together a lot of what I've been working on. You know, it's hard to do. We're not very good multitaskers. We all think we are, Matt, you know, but the science says we're terrible at it. And so the ability to step away, stop trying to juggle 7 million things and really focus on a few, 
was really helpful. I, I hear you on that. And, and there's a lot of data to back up the myth of multitasking, if you will. And especially if you look more into the science of people's brains, certain people are wired for that and certain people are not. I am one that is not. There's you know some theory on the types of neurotransmitters that you have and how much you can focus. And I'm someone who loves to jump around and can quite possibly not accomplish anything during a day uh, because I love getting that little hit of dopamine. But I'll share with you, Mike, I'm, I'm actually in the process of writing my first book. Uh, it's called The Millennial Travel Guidebook and trying to get more young people to get out and, and see the world. And I have been just chipping away at it. And I mean, very slowly, like one word in front of the other, every morning trying to get an hour's worth of writing. And it's a long, long process. So I'm curious if you had any uh, any advice for chipping away at a book, which is just such a daunting task. I'm on, I'll share with you, I'm on chapter six right now. Hey, that's great though. Yeah, not bad. I will tell you that for me, I found that it's really important that when you do get on a roll, somehow you have to find a way to just keep going and not get distracted and go do other things. Because when you really get in that zone, you got to just stay in that zone. You know, I'd call my wife and be like, yeah, I'll be home later than I thought. I'm, I'm in the zone right now, you know, and I just, I can't stop. Right. And uh, the ability to do that, that was really important. I think the other thing is it's helpful to also be reading while you're writing, reading what other people have done, you, finding models of uh, you get a lot of ideas on how, how did they approach it? How did they break up their chapters? You know, how did they weave stories and examples in? And I don't do that by reading other books like what I'm trying to write. I do that by finding books that are kind of not, you know, they're different. Go outside of, don't read business books. In your case, don't just look at travel books. Get your ideas from other places too um, and see, huh, how could I maybe apply what they did in that kind of book to what I'm, the kind of book I'm trying to write? In the language of academics, we call this analogous inspiration, right? Looking to some related field and that's not the same as what you're doing. There's some analogy between what they're doing and what you're trying to do. And can you apply it back? That's a great way to help you think about, well, how could I attack this book? Or how could I get write this chapter, organize it when maybe you have hit a mental block? Uh, that's really interesting. This is the second time this is come up on the podcast. There's a guy named Srini who I interviewed and he runs a podcast. Uh, I believe it's called Unmistakably Creative. And uh, we're, we can link all the show notes up on this on under30co.com. So if we mention any books or any resources that people want to see, we can, of course, link to them. Uh, but Mike, I'm, I'm curious what you like to read that gets your creativity going. So I'll tell you, one of the things, I, I'm a history buff, so I love looking at great figures in history and understand I'm buried right now in a thousand-page book about Winston Churchill. There's so many lessons, good and bad, about leadership and decision-making and problem-solving and communication from Churchill. And I, So I, I love to read history. And also, when I travel, I try to make sure I go see for myself you know, some of the great artifacts of history or some of the places where great events happen. So that's for me is a really good inspiration. I also love sports, so you know that's another place where I like to read and but I think it's important. You don't want to just bury yourself in, in the field that you know because you know one of the things that happens to us is the more we just immerse ourselves in our area of expertise, the more we get trapped in the conventional wisdom of that area. This is the way it's always been done. And that's really problematic for most of us, right? And we're all vulnerable to that. So it's important you do get out and look at what are people doing in that field or this field? And look at what travel companies do. Well, the bottom line is most travel companies do a lot of things the same way. And so you're going to get trapped into thinking way as opposed to exploring new mental models of how we're an outstanding a travel experience for our customer. This thing that's, well, who else delivers great customer experiences? Not in the travel industry. And what could we learn from them? You could come up with all kinds of great ideas, right? And so what, one example that's given sometimes is, you know, if you were in a business where speed was really important, the speed of customer service, go study a race car pit crew. What do they do? How do they deliver like this incredible amount of activity so fast to their customer who's the driver, right? What could you learn from them? Or if you were in a business where customer experience was incredible, 
go study the Ritz-Carlton. What do they do and how do they deliver incredible customer service and experience? And how could you apply it to your business, which might have nothing to do with the hotel business? It's a great way to learn. No, that's, that's fantastic advice. And one thing that really helped us in the travel business, going with that example that you gave, was we figured it out and started from scratch without knowing that we were even in the travel industry. Or, of course, we knew we were in the travel industry, but we've never, I mean, still, I could count the travel events that I've been to probably on my on my one hand or any industry, you know, I, I don't know all that much about the industry. And I'm sure we have customers listening and are like, geez, man, uh, get with it. But seriously, our community model never would have come about had we not taken that from other places and other inspirations. That's why we call ourselves a travel community and not a travel company, because there's so many travel companies out there. And well, I'll give you a good example. Yeah, please. Well, I'll tell you that. So Herb Kelleher, the co-founder of Southwest Airlines, just died last week. And Kelleher, in building Southwest Airlines, a totally different kind of airline they created 50 years ago, uh, he would say that he did not want to hire people who had worked at legacy airlines. He would rather have hired, and he did, because the people at the legacy airlines were trapped into thinking about doing it a certain way. And he had a vision for building a very different kind of airline which he did really successfully. Or, you know, uh, I recently, I I wrote a case study and I wrote about in the book about Planet Fitness, a totally different kind of gym, right? But Planet Fitness said, you know, we're not, we're not trying to build a gym like Gold's Gym or Bally or Ballet Fitness. We're trying to build a gym for people who don't go to the gym. And so their whole like, you know, gym intimidation concept came out about from saying, we're not going after the 20% of people who already are into fitness and going to a gym. We're not trying to steal members from other gyms. We're trying to go after the 80% of people who are going to the movies or going to eat fast food instead of getting fit. And how do we convince them to get fit, to come to a gym? And what kind of environment do we have to create to do that? So it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool that they basically said, hey, wait a second. Our competition isn't other gyms. Our competition is other things people are doing other than going to the gym and how do we persuade them? Uh, it's a pretty cool story. Yeah, I, absolutely. The, uh, the judgment free zone as they call planet fitness. That's really interesting. And uh, I'm curious actually, Mike, so our core team at under 30 experiences, actually all people who do not come from the travel industry, some have a little bit of experience, but nothing on a, upper management scale, if you will. And so our core team are, are people who just come from various creative backgrounds. I mean, geez, one guy was a carpenter and he can directly apply that to figuring out how to build good customer service and just pretty level-headed people in, in the most part who want to execute and think creatively. But we've noticed that as we've grown and we've had to hire people for very specific tasks, we've become more specified. And all right, we need to hire someone who's an expert in search engine optimization. Okay, well, the, you can't hire a carpenter to do that. There's just no way. Or we have regional managers across the world who we really need them to have experience, 10 plus years of experience working with in the travel industry, and they know all of the hotels and have a network of guides who work with them and are well adapt to write emergency preparedness plans and and things like that. So I'm curious if you see people on different levels of organizations coming from uh, specific areas. And if that theory that you just explained how, okay, yeah, you can, you can take people who are not necessarily from your industry and apply them to a different industry and they will have lots of creativity. Do you see that happening with, in all the different layers of organizations? Well, I think the thing to think about is you have to not just create ideas, you have to execute. So when it comes to executing, you're going to need a whole lot of experts who have a lot of industry knowledge. Right. And so, so we're not saying you want everybody, right, to lack industry knowledge. You just want to make sure that you don't have yourself where 100% of the people in your company all come from the same industry and are trapped into one way of thinking. You want to blend, you want to create a, a melting pot, a mix. Some people who come from a fresh perspective and some have deep expertise in what you're doing. But I think the other thing I'm saying is it's not so much about who you hire, it's about 
what they do once you have them. So you could have someone who has deep expertise in the travel business. But what I'm saying is as they go about thinking about what you should do next at your company, so it's more about your learning and your approach to gathering ideas than about your own background. You could be somebody who's worked in the travel industry for 30 years, but if you're really approaching your job intelligently, you're not just benchmarking other travel companies. You're benchmarking other great companies, doing other things that might be helpful for you. So I think it's more about that, about your actions, than it is about where you came from. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks for your perspective on that. And actually wanted to ask you about sports a little bit. I know, of course, your beloved Patriots are in the AFC Championship again. And by the time this comes out, I'm sure they'll already have won the another Super Bowl. Uh, <laughs> but I'm curious if you've read anything interesting about sports that has applied. I would say two books that I've read recently that were ones that I could not put down were A, uh, Tiger Woods' new biography. It just was a fascinating story for better or for worse. And then also, I didn't actually have as much to do with sports as you might think, but Phil Knight's Shoe Dog is another book that I just found amazing how they built that company. I, I'm curious if you've read anything good lately. You know, I, I haven't read a sports book in the last six or seven months, but I, I will tell you, I did some research as part of the book. So one of the concepts I, I think gets in the way of creativity is the idea, I call it the prediction mindset. We tell, especially in large organizations, we say, is this idea going to move the needle? Is it going to be about how big is the market? And if it's not a big idea, we're not interested. I hate this concept, Matt, because the presumption is that you, Matt, can tell me accurately whether an idea is a big idea or a niche idea. And the answer is we're not very good at predicting that, right? The research shows that it's really hard at the early stages to know whether an idea is a really big idea or it's a niche idea. And in fact, sometimes it's helpful to just focus on the niche and deliver an exceptional customer experience for the niche. And then figure out how you might go beyond that later on. So let me just say two things. One, why this relates to sports is I gathered some data for the book with regard to the issue of prediction on how good NFL teams are at predicting who will be a star quarterback in the league. And I, did, I collected 15 years of data on number one draft picks at quarterback. And you know, only four of 48 of them over a 15-year period, only four of them won a Super Bowl. Wow. And about a third of them became pro bowlers. That's pretty good. But about a third of them were complete busts and washed out of the league. That's just an example of how, you know, even these people who have incredible expertise in an industry, predictions hard. So I'll give me a business example that I didn't write about, but that I've been following more recently, even after I finished the book, is uh, Yeti. So look at Yeti. If we'd gone back to the founders when they started that company and said, is this a big idea? When they initially built the company, they built it for hardcore hunters and fishermen, building these really expensive coolers that were designed for a very unique need for people who are really extreme, right? They're not the average person. They would have said, you know, we would have said, that's not a very big market. In a big company, we would have crushed that idea because it wouldn't have moved the needle. We'd be like, my God, okay, so there's only X number of, of avid hunters and fishermen. There's not enough people for that to be a big enough market for that to move our top line. We might have crushed the idea. Instead, what happens? These entrepreneurs, they start by delivering this incredible experience with these high-end coolers to a very, very small slice. Not all hunters and fishermen, right? It's really only a small slice of hunters and fishermen who need their product, which is so expensive. But then what do they do? They deliver an amazing product for them, and then word begins to spread, and they build a cult-like following. And now they're selling my teenage daughters a $30 water bottle. <laughs> my teenage daughters are not avid hunters and fishermen, right? But if we ask people, can your idea move the needle? We sometimes dispatch ideas that may someday be really big, but in the beginning, what they really are is a really niche idea for a very, very small market. And so I think that's one of the things that we do badly with regard to creativity and innovation is we put people in the spot of saying, can you predict? Just like we say, can you predict that Tom Brady is going to become the greatest player of all time? He was a six-round draft pick. I mean, and we say, oh, that's the exception. It's not actually. <laughs> it turns out that, you know, we're not very good at predicting at times. 
God, the sports trivia is killing me right now. Do you know uh, who, those, who are the four number one draft picks? Do you remember? Uh, Roethlisberger is one. Oh. Aaron Rodgers is another. Um, and I'd have to go back and look. But I know Rodgers and uh, I hate to say it, but I think Eli Manning. Oh, geez. Eli. I think you're a New York fan. Aren't you? No, no. I'm a Packers fan. And uh, actually, Aaron Rodgers was picked uh, like 20. He's, he has that famous story of falling so far. For He was Cal quarterback and fell so far in the draft, uh, I think, in 2008. I actually remember sitting in Salmonson Dining Hall watching this guy fall in the draft and making fun of him. And then there he was getting picked up by the Packers when like the 20 something pick. And now, well, that's worked out pretty well for us. Yeah, pretty good. Not as well as uh, our guy, but he did OK. Yeah, he's well, not this year, but she's uh, uh, actually that's funny that you mentioned Yeti. They are right down the street uh, from us here in Austin and uh, yeah, have this amazing flagship store that I've actually never been into. Uh, and in fact, <laughs> we have a couple people on the team who are big Yeti fans and the other half of the team who thinks these coolers are absolutely ridiculous, uh, <laughs> all make fun of them. And but look, Hey man, uh, nobody's going to get your, no bear is going to sneak up to you on the, your backyard barbecue this weekend and steal your beers. You can just put it in a $30 cooler instead of your $300 cooler. But I, I ought to go in there and, and check out what they're actually doing. You know what, Matt though, that is a great one because actually I think some of the greatest brands the most creative brands have passionate fans and they have people who hate them. And that's okay. You would much rather, instead of having, well, a whole bunch of pleased customers, I'd much rather have some really passionate fans and then some people who really don't like my brand and reject it. I'd much rather have that than just a bunch of people who are kind of satisfied, right? Because those people aren't going to be evangelists for the brand, are they? And I'm okay with the fact that I've created something so distinctive that it's not for everyone. Not too many companies want to be all things to all people, but they end up with a watered down product as a result. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, Mike, I actually wanted to go back uh, for a second and ask you, I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I wanted to ask you if people find themselves in a not so creative area where they are stuck in a job that doesn't feel creative or they are at a academic institution where they look around and say, oh my God, all the professors here have been here for 30 years and are teaching the same exact way. And, uh, or they come from a place that every, just pumps out homogeneous people. And they're trying to break out of that and figure out out uh, where they can get a little inspiration. Uh, we've already touched on travel, which would be a one easy answer for this, but how can people go about actually affecting change in their community? I think you start small. I'm a big believer in a small win strategy, right? You don't go try to change an entire institution, whether you're in a nonprofit, whether you're in academics, you're in a business, you're in a healthcare system. You know, one person, even a fairly senior person, is not likely to be able to transform everything. Instead, what you have to say is, what's my small win strategy? You know, how can I take and do one thing differently, prove to people, show them some results, right? And win some allies, influence people, get people on board to go after the next thing, right? It's much easier to persuade through results than to persuade through words. I'm not a fan of words. I'm a fan of results. So I think it's about finding in whatever you do, your small win. What's the small win you want to go after and prove to people, huh, that's a different way of doing things. And that worked. And now my confidence in you has grown and I begin to win some support, right? So that's, I'm a big believer in that no matter what your job is, your industry, that that's a really important thing to do. And I think it's a really helpful strategy. And I'm, I'm glad you said that. It just reminds me of, uh, you know, one of our favorite stories at Bryant's when, when I was there, it was not a hotbed of entrepreneurship by any means. And the feeling, to be honest, was, hey, maybe you should have gone to Babson, kid. And we just started making little wins and little wins. And uh, my favorite example, of course, is once we – this culminated into a much bigger win and uh, our – chapter of the Collegiate Entrepreneurs Organization ended up winning best chapter in the world that Ron Makeley, the president of the university, 
ended up emailing me from his BlackBerry and saying, hey, great, congratulations. I always knew uh, Bryant was a great place for entrepreneurship. And now it is, which is just another example of how people can affect change step by step. Five times national chapter of the year, right? All started with that one little conversation and, and a few steps, right? I think that's so important. And at the heart of that, it's because, you know, I would argue the creative process is about learning. Or we're talking about changing education, not just telling people what to do. So, so does running a business. It's not about the, your five-year plan. Uh, yes, you have to plan. But, you know, Eisenhower once said, uh, planning is everything, but plans are useless. What he meant by that is you're going to plan like heck if you're preparing the D-Day invasion. You have to be incredibly prepared. But once the bullets start flying, you better be flexible and be ready to adapt to this dynamic environment or you're going to get in trouble. Or as Mike Tyson once said, everybody has a plan until I punch him in the mouth, right? I mean, (laughs) you got to adapt. And so I think that's so important. But learning by doing, right? This idea that the creative process is not a linear one. It's kind of nonlinear. It grows and fits and starts. And one of the best things you can do is go out and try something, test, experiment, and then learn and adapt. The problem for many entrepreneurs, Matt, is we fall in love with our original idea and we don't adapt. I think that's what I see. So we talk about pivoting. We talk about MVP, minimum viable product, lean startup. All that sounds great in theory. But for most people, what ends up happening is they come up with an idea. They fall in love with their idea. And then they find a way to dismiss or rationalize away the feedback they're getting from the market instead of really listening and adapting. And And that's why, unfortunately, many startups fail. Wow. And and Mike, before I let you go, I I have to ask you, if people are on this path themselves, it is very difficult to know whether your idea is the right idea and you just need to focus and you just need to execute and you just need to keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, or that they should pivot and they should try something differently in your research. How do you know? Well, you can only know by getting out there and testing your idea and then making sure that you're not the only one listening to the feedback, that you've got some other eyes and ears, you know, because you got, you have your blinders on. So you need other people, people you trust, confidants, who are going to tell you the truth, the unvarnished truth about that feedback, you know, so they're hearing too. So I, I was listening to a podcast. I don't know if you listen to the, how I built this podcast, but I love it. They interview all these uh, famous founders of companies and I was listening to the founders of Rent the Runway talk about how they figured out whether their idea was any good. And the answer is they they were at Harvard Business School during an MBA. They walked across the river, set up a pop-up where they went and bought a bunch of dresses on their credit card. And before like a big prom or dance that the undergraduates had, they set up a pop-up and they rented dresses to the undergrads. It was a test. Would people do this, rent a dress? Would they return it, right? (laughs) Or would they just steal it? And they learned a whole bunch, right? They learned a ton by doing that. But it's important when you do that, that you've got some other eyes and ears helping you listen and learn. Because otherwise, you know, if it's just you, you can run the test, but not learn much from the test. Sure. I I couldn't agree more. And that's that's a uh, great example. And we can try to link that podcast up again in the show notes on under30ceo.com so you guys can have access to all the resources. Mike, this has been awesome. Of course, your new book is called Unlocking Creativity, How to Solve Any Problem and Make the Best Decisions by Shifting Creative Mindsets. But I want to ask you where people can reach out to you directly, whether it's on social media or otherwise, and follow along with what you're doing. Yeah, so they certainly can. Um, They can on Twitter, I'm uh, Michael A. Roberto. On Facebook, uh, my Facebook professional page is uh, is at Professor Michael Roberto. Uh, so certainly Facebook and Twitter, LinkedIn, I'm out there. And uh, so easy to find me on the web. Uh, I've got a blog out there and a website too they can find by Googling me. And I hope they do engage, make it a conversation. I, I'd love to hear other people's ideas on how to unlock creativity as well as my own. I don't, I don't have all the truth. I've done my best to try to put some ideas together. But I hope this starts a conversation with a lot of folks out there. Awesome. Well, I'm sure it will. Congrats on the launch and uh, I'm excited for you. Thanks for coming on, Mike. Thanks for having me, Matt. Great to talk to you again.